Hello, this is Jack Jackson. Today we're going to be looking at combining functions. So, the idea here is we want to take two existing functions and somehow combine them to create a new function. So, sort of building new from old. We're going to do this in two basic ways. One is using an arithmetic operation like add, subtract, multiply, or divide to combine functions. And another one is composition, which you chain them up uh, one after the other. So sometimes we like to build new functions by combining two other functions and one way is to combine them using it to generate a new function is with basic arithmetic operations. So we can say uh, define a new function f plus g of x to be f of x plus g of x. Of course for this to work you have to already know uh, or have a function f of x and a function g of x they have to be defined at the x value, both of them. And if you have that, then we can define this new function f plus g at that particular x by just uh, doing f and g separately and then taking their outputs and adding them together. So if we think of this as a little factory, you walk in the door with an x, the first thing they do is they make a copy of it. One copy goes to f assembly line, the other copy of x goes to the g assembly line. F assembly line does their thing, doesn't care what G's doing, they get an output, they're F of X. Same, similarly, at the same time, G of X takes the X input, the same input, does their thing, whatever their assembly line says to do, and out the door pops G of X. Okay, but then there's one more person at the end that takes the F of X and the G of X, the output from F and the output for G, and then just simply adds them together and then that is your final output. Similarly, we can take f minus g of x, and that's f of x minus g of x, or f times g of x is f of x times g of x, or f divided by g of x is f of x divided by g of x. So notice that in these operations we first separately evaluate the functions f and g at the input x, and then we simply combine the intermediate outputs f of x and g of x by the indicated basic operation. So notice for this to work, you have to be able to, to find f of x and g of x first. And so the domains ha of, of, say, f plus g of x, has, it has to be something that's in the domain of f, and it has to be something that's in the domain of g. So it's the intersection of those two domains. And in fact, we can add anything, basically, or any real numbers at least, any complex numbers. So we... Um, we see that that's exactly the domain. So the domain of f plus g of x is the domain of f of x uh, intersected with the domain of g of x. Similarly, the domain of f minus g and the domain of f times g are also the intersections of the domain of f with the domain of g. But um, we start the same way on f divided by g. It's also the domain of f divided by the domain of g, I mean, I mean intersected with the domain of g. Domain of f intersected with the domain of g but then we have to worry about one thing. Well, whereas we can add, subtract, and multiply pretty much anything, there's one thing we can't divide by, and of course that's zero. And so we have to remove from that uh, potential domain, the intersection of F, domain of F, the intersection of the domain of G, we have to remove from that the um, places that make G of X zero, so we do not divide by zero. So let's look at this example here. Suppose f of x is 3x plus 1, g of x is x squared minus 3. And suppose we want to evaluate all these uh, four new functions, f plus g, f minus g, f times g, and f divided by g, at 2. Okay. See if you can do this now. You should be able to do this based on what we've already talked about. Press pause now. Okay, now that you're back, hopefully you did it this way here. Let's take a look and see what we have. So we have f plus g of 2. Well, that's f of 2 plus g of 2. And so f of 2, well, you look at the formula. It says 3 times input plus 1. So that's 3 times 2 plus 1. 3 times 2 is 6 plus 1 more is 7. So f of 2 is 7. Similarly, g of 2, uh, g over here is input squared minus 3. So that's 2 squared minus 3. That's 4 minus 3 is 1. 7 plus 1, then, is 8. 
So notice again that we got the output of F and the output of G separately. Uh, we found the 7 and the 2, and then we simply add those two together at the end. Similarly, if we want to do F minus G of 2, again, we find F of 2 and G of 2 separately. There are again 7 and 1, but this time we subtract at the end instead of adding. So we get 7 minus 1 is 6, so our output is 6 at the end. The other two work basically the same way. Again, we find F of 2 and G of 2 to be 7 and 1, and, this, and, and we multiply them to get 7 to find F times G of 2. And to do F divided by G of 2 is just F of 2 divided by G of 2. So again, we find the 7 and the 1, but this time it's division that we put between them. So 7 divided by 1 is 7. So the only difference, as you notice in these four, is the operation that's applied in the last step. And so if I were going to do one of these like this and figure it out for a particular number, this is exactly how I would do it. If I had to do this for a whole bunch of numbers, then I might be interested in finding an explicit formula for f plus g at an arbitrary x, or f minus g at x, and so forth. So see if you can figure out what these would be as arbitrary uh, x's. In other words, what is the formula for these? Go ahead and do this now. Press pause. Well, again, f plus g of x is just f of x plus g of x. So f of x is 3x plus 1. g of x is x squared minus 3. And so there it is. We have it. We can simplify or, you know, reorder it, reorganize it a little bit, and put it as x squared plus 3x. And then we can take the 1 minus 3 to get net, uh, minus 2. And so we get x squared plus 3x minus 2. Similarly, the f minus g of x, uh, same thing. We do the f of x and the g of x. This time we subtract. This time when we do the subtraction, we can just drop the first parentheses, but the second parentheses, when we drop it, we need to do, use the distributive property to multiply that negative 1 across. So that gives us negative x squared and plus 3. So when we reorganize in decreasing order, that's negative x squared um, Oops, that should say plus 3x, and then uh, plus, uh, plus 4. So it's 1 plus 3. That becomes plus 3, so that's 4. That's still positive 3. In fact, let me just fix that real fast. This should be plus. Okay, there we go. Now, moving on. F times G of 3 is, is the same thing here. And here we basically use the distributive property. We have X squared times 3X is 3X cubed. We've got X squared times 1 is X squared. We have 3X times negative 3 is negative 9X, and the 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. So if we wanted to expand that out, we could. We could also leave it factored like that if we'd rather. Sometimes it's better to have it factored. Sometimes it's better to have it expanded out. But either way you go, these, these last two are equivalent, and that's a formula. Okay, let's look at the next one. F divided by g of x is f of x over g of x, so that's just 3x plus 1 over x squared minus 3. Really not much else we can do with that one, so we just leave it like it is. Now, see if you can do this one here. I've given some inputs here, negative 5, negative 4, and so forth, up to the integers from negative 5 to 5. And I've defined a function f of x is 3x and another function g of x that is x plus 4. Evaluate those functions at those values of x and then use these values to compute these new functions f plus g of x, f minus g of x, f times g of x, and f divided by g of x. Okay, please work this out now. Press pause. Okay, so we want to come back and fill this in. I don't have my slide filled out because I want to show you um, so, uh, an easy way to go at this. And one easy way to do this is with a spreadsheet such as Microsoft Excel. And so I could have, here I have my x values. Let's see, it's negative 5, negative 4. And notice it's, if we take this, I'm going to uh, center that. And if I grab this corner and drag this down, it's going to recognize that pattern and continue it on down as far as I want it to go, in this case down to 5. Uh, I'm going to want a bunch, whoops. 
I want a bunch of this stuff centered, so I'm going to just go over here and center some things up. And I'm going to make this maybe, uh, what if I want to do, uh, let's see, I can change the font. Let's suppose I want uh, all, let's say, Times New Roman, for example. And let's say on this first one, maybe I want it bold and italic. Okay. So then I can say f of x equals, uh, I think it was 3x. Let me look back at my, yes, yeah, 3x. So I'm going to write that there. g of x was, what was it, x plus 4. And then we want to do f plus g of x, f minus g of x, I'm just going to call it fg of x, f times g of x, and then f divided by g of x. Okay, uh, let me do a couple of things here, just formatting, I'm going to go here and put some boxes around that, uh, lines, and let's maybe make some thick lines here, and here, and well, around the whole outside. So we got us a nice little table here. Now, in Excel, I can go here and use the formula 3 times x for f of x. So let's do this. So in Excel, you start formulas with an equals. So you say equals. And I want three times, well, I want three times that value right there. Now, here's a really cool thing about Excel. If I copy this and then paste it here, notice that it automatically uh, filled this out with what we call relative referencing. So, for example, here it says three times A2. When I copied it, it didn't put three times A2 here. It put three times A3. So when I copy this, it's thinking three times the cell to the left. The cell, you know, when instead of A2, it's thinking the cell immediately to the left. So when it's copied, this is three times the cell immediately to the left of that one. And that's exactly what we want. And, of course, these were easy enough to do by hand. You didn't need a calculator or a computer or anything for these. We can easily multiply negative 5 times 3 to get negative 15 and negative 2 times 3 to get negative 6. But I did want to show you uh, some little bit of the technology here. Of course, we could do these by hand. Negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1, and negative 4 plus 4 is 0, and so forth. And just do those by hand. But I can also work this one out as well. I can say equals. I want to take that x value plus 4. And again, if I copy that, control C, and go down here and paste, control V, or I can copy and paste from up here as well, then that gives me a... Uh, my values for g of x. And so now to find f plus g of x, it just equals that 15 plus that negative, negative 15 plus negative 1 there. And again, if I copy that and paste it down there, that's going to give me f plus g of x. Similarly, I, I can do this one as f and then minus the g. And this one what can be the f times the g times in Excel and most computers is the asterisk button. That's multiplication. And uh, this one is F divided by G. We get that. I can copy that. Paste it all down here. We do have one problem and that is right here where we get division by zero. So right there it's actually undefined. So I'm going to actually write in undefined instead, divide by zero, but it's that's why it's undefined, it's because we're dividing by zero. Oops, let me paste down here. Okay, these are um, approximations right here. This is really 1.6 repeating. 
So if I really want to do this correctly, I need to put this in a fraction form. So what is it? We can work it out here. Let's just do it by hand. F divided by G is 9 sevenths. And I want it to, if I just write 9, let's see. If I do 9 over 7, it's probably going to interpret that as a date. That's no good. So if I put a, a, an asterisk, that says to put in text. So that's put in 9 sevenths there. And this one is 15 ninths, which reduces to 5 thirds, or 1 and 2 thirds. Okay, that is that. And I'm just going to put them in there so that's exact values. 0.6 is correct exactly, but if I'm going to use fractions for the others, I might as well use a fraction here, 3 fifths. Okay. So now I have a nice looking table, and I'm just going to take that table, copy it, go back over here, and paste this. Let's see if this is going to work. Yeah, this will be fine. Let me just do a little cleanup here in uh, PowerPoint. And now we have a table. Okay, that has the correct answers in it. Okay, so we have that. So you can check that, these numbers here, you can check them against uh, what you have here. Okay, let's continue on. Now, what if we have a, have a graph of f and g of x? Uh, let's say the, the blue one is, let's see, the red one, let's say, is f of x, and then the blue one is g of x, although when you're adding, the order doesn't really matter. How can we see f plus g of x graphically? What's that going to mean? Well, remember, f of x is really the the, high, the well, it's the the y coordinate of the points on the the red graph, and it's basically how far up we are. Well, the g of x is the y coordinates, or how far we up on the are blue. We need to add these two together, so we get what's what we end up with is the green here. Let's see if you can see what's going on here. So, for example, right here, I've got it marked. We take this distance here from 0 up to, say, that blue amount. And from the red, we go up the same distance, and we end up at the green. So we're adding, we're adding the heights of one on top of the other. So, for example, here, um, we take the height of the blue, which is here, and we take that long, exactly that long, and that's how far we go above the red to get to the final answer, the green. Here we take how far the blue is up, let say from here to here, and that's how far we go up here. If the graph blue was going below, these arrows would be pointing down and we'd go, we'd go below the red. In this case, the blue is always on or above the x-axis, so the arrows are pointing up. And so we go up this far, however far that is, looks like it's about three units. Okay, and so we go up about three units from this red, and that gets us to the point on the green. Okay, here we're going from here all the way up to here. Take that same length, go from here up to there. So with that same x value, we can see that. Similarly, if we were finding differences of two graphs, we would be finding the differences in these two heights and so we would basically be finding the distance between the two graphs. So we can kind of see visually what's going on there. Now I want to move on to composition of functions. Composition of functions is a very, very important way of putting functions together. A very natural way, really. What we do is we combine two functions by letting the output of the first function be the input for the second function. 
So think of what hap this is what happens pretty much any time that we have a multi-step process. Think of like an assembly line. You've got a worker on the assembly line. They're past some input. They do whatever they do on the assembly line. And when they're finished with it, they pass it on. As far as they're concerned, they're done. They've finished it up. It's a finished product for them. But for the next person in the assembly line, that is not a finished product. That's the raw materials. That's the input. So the output of one becomes the input for the next. And we can chain these together in however many steps we want to build up multi-step functions. In fact, we can think of all functions as being compositions of just one-step functions. A whole bunch of them perhaps put together to give us a multi-step function. So um, this is called composition, and we use this raised circle between the functions to mean composition. So f composed g of x is defined to be f of g of x. So notice that this works from right to left. We really, in functions in general, work right to left. We start with the input x, and then we apply the function g. And in this case, we've got another function. So we start with the, func the input x, we apply the function g, to get an output, then that output we apply the function f to get the final output. So if we look at it as an arrow diagram, if we want to do f compose g of x, we start with our x, we first apply the function g to get g of x. That basically generates the ordered pair x comma g of x. Then we use that g of x as the input now and apply the function f, you know, the function on the right first, then the function on the left, and we do f of that g of x. So that generates an ordered pair where g of x is now the first coordinate and f of g of x is the second coordinate. So notice that the, the g of x is, a, is an output the first step, but then it's an input the second step. It's a second coordinate the first time, then it's a first coordinate, and then ultimately what happens is the function that takes you all the way from x over to the end is the function f composed g of x. And so it has a first coordinate of x and a last coordinate of f of g of x. So let's do this in a particular example. So let's suppose g of x is the function 2 times x. And let's start with an input, say, of 4. So we first apply g of g to 4. So we say, what is g of 4? It's 2 times 4, which is 8. So that's, we're talking about basically the ordered pair 4, 8. Then we want to find f of that. So we're talking about f of the 8. So we're doing f composed g of 4. That's f of g of 4. The g of 4 is 2 times 4, which is 8. So we have f of 8. Well, we have 8 for the output of the first step of g. But that 8 is going to become the input for the f. And so now when we do f of x, let's say f of x is the function x plus 3, then we take that 8 and add 3 to it to get 11. So the input is 8, the output is 11 for that step. And so notice that the 8 was the output the first time, but it's the input the second time. Ultimately, we started with a 4 and ended with an 11. So the function f plus g of 4 is 11, it takes 4 and maps it to 11. That corresponds to the ordered pair 4, 11. We can see this pretty nicely in a Dynagraph um, version here because here we start with our initial inputs down here on the bottom and then we apply the first function uh, g of x and that gives us this these intermediate uh, outputs from the first step, but those outputs from the first step become the inputs for the next step. And of course, ultimately, what we have is going, say, from this original pink L here all the way up to here is your dynagraph for the final composition. Uh, so in this case, the first function is g of x is 2 times x and f of x is x plus 3. Let's follow this red point A right here and follow it. A is 2. We first apply g of x. So g of 2 is 2 times 2, which is 4. So 2 gets mapped to 4. See it here? So this one right here goes to 4. Now what we do, we apply the function f at the 4. So we take the x plus 3, that's 4 plus 3 is 7, so that takes us to here. So ultimately we went from 2 
to 7. And of course, as you see, if we, we could add another layer to this if we wanted to. We could take those outputs at the end here, apply another function, and another function, another function. We can make this as many layers deep as we want. So after studying this lecture um, and this unit, what should you be able to do? Well, you should be able to combine function using addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and composition. You should know the notation for that and be able to apply this.